So you're very welcome to the, the last in this series of uh, videos on Passive House and let's reflect for a few moments what we've learned so far. We've learned about the general principles of having a good compact building and, and facing the sun. We've learned about super insulation levels, we've learned about eliminating thermal bridges, we've looked at triple glazed highly performing windows, we've learned about heat recovery ventilation. So we've put all these ingredients now into our building fabric and the outcome of all that is that we're dramatically reducing our space heat demand from a figure of maybe 100 kilowatt hours per square meter per year just down to 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year and we've reduced our heating load from what would normally be maybe 100 watts per square meter just down to 10 watts per square meter. So we haven't eliminated the heating demand entirely and we still do have a need for some heating device or if you're in a, in a very hot climate some cooling device and this video is going to look at these aspects in quite some detail. Now part of our mission with this video as well is we want to distinguish uh, between space heating demand and our space heating load and in order to make this, these two concepts of demand and load very easy to understand we're going to bring it to a petrol station and use the analogy of a car to really drive this concept home. So as we explained earlier, we're trying to make an analogy here uh, between uh, our space heating demand and the heat load for the house. And we thought it would be a very good example to use uh, a car because it's something that we can all relate to and understand very, very well. And when we talk about our space heating demand, it's really like the miles per gallon that we get from our car. Some cars need a very big engine and therefore consume a lot of fuel, and some cars are more energy efficient and don't consume too much fuel. So, in filling up our car now with fuel, this is really what we're talking about in terms of our space heating demand. So having explained the concept of heating energy demand as we put the fuel in the car, we can now talk for a few moments about the heating energy load. And in this case, what we're talking about is the boiler size in our building. How big a boiler do we need for our house? And the analogy with the car is a very interesting one because it's a bit like the engine size in a car. Some cars need very large engines, uh, whereas more energy efficient cars need smaller engines. Um, a hybrid car, for example, needs a very small power output, whereas a very large saloon car needs a much larger engine. So here we make the analogy between boiler size and the engine size in a car. So we're back from the petrol station now, we're back here in this certified passive house, and we want to try and uh, get a little bit closer towards defining what the space heating demand is in our passive house. And uh, we thought we could make another analogy here with something that practically everybody is very familiar with, and that is uh, bottles of wine. I want you to imagine for a moment that this is not wine, that this is a uh, home heating oil. And we know in each of these bottles there's three quarters of a liter of home heating oil. And believe it or not, for an energy inefficient building, maybe it was built in the 80s for example, this is the amount of home heating oil that you will use for every square meter per year just to maintain some level of comfort. That's 15 liters of home heating oil per square meter per year. That's your heating energy demand in an inefficient house. Let's consider next now um, an energy efficient house maybe built to the current building regulations and you can see now we've got rid of some of our wine or some of our home heating oil but we still have one, two, three, four, we still have 10 bottles here, which is seven and a half liters of home heating oil per square meter per year. And this is with uh, an energy efficient house, seven and a half liters per square meter per year for home heating. And now we're left with just two bottles, which equates to one and a half liters of home heating oil per square meter per year. That's your total energy demand in a passive house building. We've dramatically reduced 
uh, our energy consumption by something between 80 and 90 percent and that is really the secret to the success of the passive house as a very energy efficient building. What if we're not heating our passive house building with oil but we're using uh, maybe a more natural product such as uh, wood, in this case we've got wood pellets but it could be hardwood, it could be a uh, wood chip, whatever. Um, again, let's have an analogy here between an energy inefficient house and a passive house. This is the amount of wood pellets that an energy inefficient house uh, will consume for every square meter per year just to maintain um, a reasonable level of comfort. It's quite a lot, 30 kilograms per square meter per year. We've taken away one of the bags now and we're left with um, about half of the amount that we had a second ago. And this is the amount of wood pellets that you would need for every square meter uh, of your building with an energy efficient house built to the current building regulations. So no prizes for guessing folks what we're looking at now. Now we're dealing with the amount of pellets that you need to heat a passive house which has a space heat demand of just 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Just three kilos, that's all. Three kilos of pellets for every square meter per year is all you need to keep your passive house comfortable, no matter what the climate, no matter what the building type. The heat load for a passive house is 10 watts per square meter, okay? In a normal building, that could be up as high as 100 or 150 watts per square meter. So if you have a 200 square meter house, for example, and our heat load is 10 watts per square meter, then your heat load, your total heat load is just 2000 watts or two kilowatts. And believe it or not, that's exactly the heating power that you get from a standard hair dryer, such as I've got in my hand here now. So the heating power of this hair dryer, which is two kilowatts, is sufficient to keep a passive house building of 200 square meters at 20 degrees no matter what the weather is outside. It's really, really incredible. Um, I'd like to qualify that though uh, with one sort of word of caution. We don't advocate using direct electricity such as a hair dryer uh, to heat our passive houses because electricity is generally quite a dirty source of energy and is a high uh, consumer of carbon. So if you want to use electricity to heat your passive house, we prefer that you use, for example, a heat pump because with a heat pump, for every one unit of electricity you put in, you get out three or four units of heating or cooling. But I think, nevertheless, this is a really good analogy and hopefully will emphasize to you how small and how low the heat load is in a passive house. We've made a distinction between our space heating demand and our heating load. And I'd like to make another distinction at this point, if I may, between space heat generation and space heat distribution. When we're talking about space heat generation, we're really talking about how we're going to generate the little bit of heat that we need in our passive house. The demand is very low. It's 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, but it's there and we have to generate it somehow. And you're really quite free to generate that heat uh, in whatever way you like. In, uh, beside me here I have got a wood pellet boiler which burns uh, wood pellets and is uh, quite a low carbon output system. You're also free to use an oil boiler if you like or a gas boiler. Um, if you're in a hot climate you probably will use a heat pump because a heat pump can heat in the winter time and it can cool in the summer time. And you may also have a solar contribution so you may have solar thermal panels on your roof which contribute something towards the heating demand as well. So you're free to use whatever generation device you like, but do be aware of this. There's a maximum primary energy demand of 120 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And I can assure you, if you use a very dirty generation system, for example, like direct electricity or maybe a lot of oil, that you'll come very close or probably even exceed that primary energy demand of 120 kilowatt hours. Per square meter per year. And just one last comment, if you're thinking this pellet boiler looks rather large for a passive house, if you have something like this in your sitting room, it's very important that most of the energy from this boiler goes into the hot tank upstairs 
and doesn't come out into the space in which it's located. Otherwise, this space here would overheat. So do take care when selecting uh, a boiler for use in a sitting room like we have here. Make sure that it's well suited to the passive house demand. A few moments ago downstairs I showed you a pellet boiler um, which would be used to generate the heat in a passive house. You could also have a gas boiler or an oil boiler as I mentioned. And what we want to do with the energy that we've generated from that boiler is send it up to what we call a buffer tank. And this would be typical enough uh, in terms of the size and scale of a buffer tank in a passive house. And Again, using the car analogy, this is a bit like the, the battery in your car. You know the way you go to your car and you're confident all the time that the battery is charged and you can drive off in your car. Well, similarly, we want to keep this hot water tank charged with warm water. Um, and we keep it charged using our boiler, such as we saw downstairs a few moments ago. And the last thing we need to do then is we need to use the hot water that we've generated and that we're storing in this tank, we're going to use that hot water to heat the air that's passing around the house. And we heat that air with a post heater, which we're going to have a look at now. We spoke a few moments ago about heat generation. Now we're going to look at space heat distribution. So this is our ventilation equipment. Let's imagine it's a very, very cold night. It's minus five degrees outside. You've got the minus five degree air coming in here into our heat recovery equipment. Um, this pipe is super, super insulated so that this minus five degree air doesn't cool our house, cool our building. Once it passes through the heat exchanger, it's brought up to about 17 or 18 degrees Celsius, but that's still not warm enough in very cold winter nights to keep our house warm. So then we have this post heater here, or sometimes it's called a heater battery, and you can see it's connected with two pipes here. I'll explain those in a few moments. So the air temperature here is 18 degrees. It then passes through this post heater on its way around the rest of the house. And if we need heating, it's as simple as this. So here we've got our thermostat. It's set for 20 degrees Celsius. 20 degrees Celsius is what we need. If the temperature in the house drops below 20 degrees Celsius, it turns on a pump upstairs, which circulates hot water between this flow and return pipe. So if you can imagine there's hot water coming in here into this uh, grill and returning here to the hot tank upstairs. So we have 18 degrees here, but here the air is heated up maybe to 35, 40 degrees Celsius before it makes its journey around the house. And that in a nutshell, is how the vast majority of passive houses are heated. This is how we distribute the heat. So with the post heater, we've actually heated up the air now that's passing around the house to maybe 30 or 40 degrees. Uh, no higher than 52 degrees, by the way. If you heat higher than that, the dust in the air will smolder and you'll get a nasty smell. So these things are set up not to go higher than 52 degrees Celsius. So on a cold night now, you have to imagine that the air coming out of this pipe is at quite a high temperature, but it dilutes in around the space and it's all mixed in the house, so you have very, very even temperatures. So no matter what's happening outside, whether it's very, very cold or whether it's mild, we always have 20 degrees Celsius in our passive house. We have to model our heat load in the passive house planning package or the PHPP package, and the software is very clever insofar as it makes sure that your heat load or your boiler size is adequate based not only on sunny weather like we have today but also on cloudy weather. So I would like to reassure you that passive houses are not like solar houses. They actually don't need a lot of solar energy to maintain comfort. They're modelled for those two weather scenarios, sunny weather and cloudy weather. But when we do have solar energy, it's really nice um, to make the best use of it of it here like we have in our house and this is a solar thermal collector it's a free lunch if you like to put it like that you get energy for free from the sun and that energy goes into the buffer tank that we saw a few moments ago so you have this buffer tank which is fed on the one hand by our heat generator which is our boiler and on the other hand it's also being fed by the solar system 
and they all combine together to make sure that our tank is fully charged and ready to go to keep our house warm. In this video we reminded ourselves how we can reduce our space heating demand through insulation, lack of thermal bridges, good windows, good solar access and so forth and we've seen that we can reduce the space heating demand to 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. We've also seen that we can reduce our space heat load, that's the boiler size, to a tiny tiny 10 watts per square meter per year and we could heat our whole house with a hairdryer if we wanted to. And that, those two aspects really summarize in a nutshell the, the high performance of the passive house and make it crystal clear that it's without question the most energy efficient construction standard on the planet.